Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you and share my presentation entitled Reaching New Heights. As you'll see, it's built around my family's expedition on Mount Everest, but there's also a lot of practical and actionable strategies that you can use in your own work and your own life in general. So climbing to the top of the world had been a dream of my family's for many years. Each of the five members of my family had climbed one or more of the world's seven summits, which are the highest mountains on each of the seven continents. In order to prepare for Everest, and we decided to tackle Everest together as a family. So this is my sister Laura on the left, my brother Adam beside her, my mother Barbara in front, my father Daniel on the other side, and of course myself. We are a very adventuresome family and we love the outdoors. There was a huge amount of preparation involved for a trip of this magnitude. And it was a logistical nightmare trying to put it all together. This is a photo of just a portion of my personal gear. And there's an incredible amount of very expensive, very specialized equipment needed. On April 5th of 2008, we flew out of Toronto Pearson Airport and eventually arrived in Kathmandu, Nepal. Kathmandu is a very old and very poor city. It's a beautiful city in many ways, but there are millions of people all living in a very small area. So it's extremely congested. Peddlers everywhere you look trying to sell their wares just to make a living. They do have quite an electrical disaster there. It wasn't uncommon to see wiring hung like this, and they didn't produce enough electricity to power the city. So throughout the days, we'd get these rolling blackouts, which took a little bit of getting used to. We spent a few days in Kathmandu purchasing some of the equipment we hadn't brought with us from North America before taking another smaller flight to a little village called Lukla at the base of the Himalayan mountains. And Lukla really acts as the starting point for anyone climbing on or around Mount Everest on the south side. Quite an exciting flight through the Himalayan foothills, and we landed on what must be the shortest runway in the entire world. It's this upward sloping runway with a 2,000 foot cliff at the one end. When we arrived at Lukla, we had a huge number of bags. It takes two months to climb Mount Everest, so there's an incredible amount of equipment and supplies needed for this very long period of time. And generally, these heavy bags are brought into base camp by yaks. It's a 10 day trek into base camp, and we see a lot of these long yak trains along the way carrying equipment and supplies in and out of base camp. However, we arrived later than most climbers attempting to climb Everest, and when we arrived, all the yaks were gone. They were higher up on the mountain with other climbers and trekkers. And so the outfitter we had used arranged for porters to carry our very heavy bags for those first 10 days on the way into base camp. And it was incredible what these porters could carry. Just one of these bags is relatively heavy, difficult for me to lift, and they carry three or four of them. And as you can see, they're not very large. This gentleman, he didn't speak any English, but we gave him the nickname Goliath because it was just incredible what they, what they can carry. And, and they carried up some very difficult terrain. Really, their secret is they use this T-shaped walking stick and they'll go about maybe, uh, you know, 30 feet or so and then they'll put this, the, the T-shaped stick under the load and they'll rest for 30 seconds or a minute and then make another push. And that's how they're able to carry uh, the, these large loads up in and out of base camp. This is a gentleman carrying some building materials, for example. So from base camp, the, the, the route follows the Kumbu Valley that you see here. There's a rushing glacial melt river at the base of the valley, and the route is actually carved into the side of the valley in many places, and there were a lot of these cable bridges that we had to cross. Some of these bridges were very long, and some of them were also very high. And when the winds would pick up in these valleys, these bridges would start to sway and oscillate back and forth, and it really could be quite interesting crossing them, especially when a yak is crossing at the same time, which wasn't uncommon. Quite a picturesque trek though, for those first 10 days on the way into base camp. There are a lot of these prayer stones along the way, for example, that were erected by the local people. After about four days of climbing, we got our first glimpse of Mount Everest. And I remember it being a little bit intimidating because as you can see in the background, it's very high and very far away. One thing that was particularly important is, is monitoring feedback. I'll talk about some of the environmental factors in a, in a little while, but we really have two methods in terms of the feedback on our, our performance data. Um, the first is the biological or physical physiological feedback we get from our own bodies. We've climbed other mountains before this. Everyone's body acclimatizes a little bit differently. As you push into the altitude, you get the onset of acute mountain sickness, which is accompanied by headaches and nausea. If you push that too far, you get a demon lose your life. If you don't push it far enough, 
you don't adequately trigger the production of red blood cells, which is needed as, as part of the acclimatization process that we'll talk more about here in a little while. So we rely about 50% on that nowadays, but we also rely about 50% on the actual quantified data that we can get from these finger medical devices that some of you may have used called pulse oximeters that give us an actual readout of our blood oxygen percentage. At about 11,000 vertical feet, we came to a little village called Namche Bazaar. And Namche is a very picturesque village built in the saddle, saddle of this mountain. We spent a few days at Namche because at this altitude is where we really needed to start to acclimatize. As you move higher up on the mountain, the air becomes thinner with less available oxygen. And you need to give your body time to adapt to these new conditions. Now what your body's doing is it's uh, creating more red blood cells. Your red blood cells, of course, have the hemoglobin which carries the oxygen molecule. So the most important thing at this altitude is to not go up too fast. If you do go up too fast, you run the risk of getting this acute mountain sickness, which is where your small blood vessels constrict and will rupture. This leads to pulmonary edema, where the fluid leaks into your lungs and will suffocate you, or cerebral edema, where the fluid leaks into your brain, can cause you to go blind, and if you don't get down very quickly, it will kill you. And we saw climbers there with both of these edemas. So acclimatization is extremely important. We really have to maintain this future mindset. And why this is so important is that everyone for the most part is shooting for a two week weather window at the end of May, which is one of the only times you can reach the summit of Mount Everest. Most of the year the summit is in the jet stream and you get quite a few hundred mile an hour winds that would blow anything off the mountain. And then in the summertime, a monsoon comes in and it, it snows almost every day. So you also can't climb during the monsoon. But as the monsoon is approaching, it pushes the jet stream north. And we have about a two week weather window at the end of May. So like a typical endeavor you might be involved with, we have a fixed end date. We're working back from that fixed end date two months to the start of our actual execution, the actual climbing and then two years from that point back to the start of our execution, or of our planning. And if we miss anything in that whole process, we might as well pack up and head home because we're gonna miss that two week weather window at the end of May. So you can see why this future mindset is so important years before you, you even uh, think about taking on something like this. This is just a quick look at our, our work breakdown structure if we break it into financial, time, medical, knowledge, and support. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but these are the many different activities that we had to complete, especially in that, that, the two years of planning. We met some interesting people at Namche. This gentleman in the center, he's from Japan, and he's 75 years old. When he was 70, he had the world record for the oldest person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. A few years later, someone beat his record, and so he was back while we were there <laughs> to try and reclaim his title. He did make it all the way to the summit and back down, but unfortunately for him that same year, there was a local Nepalese man at 78 years old who also made it and sort of stole his thunder. But you may have read or seen on television, this would have been a few years ago now, he made another attempt at age 80, and he is the oldest person in the world to reach the summit of Mount Everest. From Namche, we can continue up the Kumbu Valley, although we're a lot higher in the valley at this point. There are still a lot of these long yak trains along the way. One thing you do learn very quickly is when passing these yaks, you want to make sure you're on the inside of the mountain and not the outside, because they will knock you right off the side. We generally ate lunch in the small farming communities that we found along the way. Sometimes the food was very good, and they tended to serve it very fresh. Oh, just kidding. We did see some interesting wildlife, though, other than chickens. It was just incredible how these mountain goats could cling to the side of this near vertical rock face. And as we move higher up in the Kumbu Valley, the route becomes a little more rustic. Some of the bridges were washed out in the spring melt, and we'd have to cross on these temporary bridges. And at about 14,000 vertical feet, in a little village called Parache, is the first time we met up with my mother. My mother had flown over earlier than the rest of us because she thought she needed a little bit extra time to acclimatize. She'd made it to base camp and was attempting to climb another smaller peak called Island Peak for acclimatization reasons when she unfortunately fell and tore her Achilles tendon and part of her calf. So she had to abandon her climb. We got to spend one day with my mother here at Parache before she started down and we continued up. It really was quite a difficult time for her climbing out from that very high altitude. 
with this serious injury, and she was all by herself, except for one porter who knew two words in English, up and no up. <laughs> Other than that, it was nonverbal communication. It really was more of an emotional journey for her than anything because she, of course, flew back to North America to get medical attention. Her entire family's on the mountain. And as you'll see in a little while, it's quite a risky endeavor in certain areas. Many of you at some point in your life have probably done uh, indoor rock climbing or rock climbing in general. And if you, if you have, you've been through the internationally recognized commands that are used in, in rock climbing between the belayer and the, and the climber. And why they've been adopted internationally is because if there's a, a break in communication between the, the, the sender and receiver, the belayer and climber, it, it can be fatal and has been in the past. And so it's kind of a, a simple example of the, the communication model, but I want to uh, kind of elaborate on why this is important to remember nowadays as well. Um, and when it comes to business communication. And so if you've done the indoor rock climbing, encode is when the climber intends to let the blair know he or she is ready to climb and encodes these thoughts into language. Transmit, climber says on belay. Decode, belayer understands this command to mean ready to climb. Acknowledge, climber signals to indicate receipt of the message or tightens the rope to indicate receipt. And feedback or response, belayer responds belay on if he or she is indeed ready to belay the climber. It can seem like a bit of a monotonous process because then we repeat this whole sequence with any other command, but it just ensures, such as up rope, slack, tension, it just ensures that we don't have that break in communication. The challenge nowadays, and it's been exacerbated to some degree by the, by the, uh, the pandemic, and, and, and to some degree, I guess, on how we adopt technology, but instead of having the face-to-face -face meeting, we have a phone call. Instead of a phone call, it's an email. Instead of an email, it's an instant message or a text and we're cutting out pieces of the communication model. And that can really get us into trouble because we have to kind of assume that it has been read and assume that it has been understood and assume that it has been acted upon. And so whenever possible, even when we're embracing technology, we want to remember to make sure we have all five pieces of the communication model. We got our first snowstorm at Parache during the night, which left us with some very interesting scenery in the morning. From Parache, we continue up the Kumbu Valley for a, a few hours before we finally arrive at this small tea house called Dugla. And from Dugla, there's about a 1,000 vertical foot, very steep hill to climb. And at the top of this hill is a very eerie section where there are about 100 memorials for many of the climbers that have lost their lives on Mount Everest. It's quite sobering to go through that particular section. And for those of you who've read the fairly famous book, Into Thin Air, or seen the Hollywood movie that was released a few years ago just entitled Everest. This is actually the memorial for one of the guides, Scott Fisher, who perished in the 1996 disaster on Mount Everest. As we get closer to base camp, the trail becomes a little less discernible, and eventually after about 10 days of climbing, we finally arrive at base camp at about 17,500 vertical feet in elevation. The tents at base camp are built every year right on top of the Kumbu Glacier. And the glacier is continuously moving and changing shape. So base camp is continuously moving and changing shape. This is the highest point for the most part that they're able to do helicopter rescues nowadays because the air is too thin above this point. And so almost on a daily basis, we had helicopters coming in and out of base camp doing rescues. And of the two months we spent climbing Mount Everest, about a month of it was spent right here at base camp for climatization reasons that I'll mention in a moment. Base camp is located within a horseshoe of mountains. So all day and night we see and hear these avalanches coming towards the tents. They're quite interesting to watch. They make a sound like thunder. And luckily up until a few years ago, none of the avalanches had ever reached the tents at base camp. There's an avalanche at base camp. So this was the mess tent at base camp, which was provided by our outfitter. These are all the other climbers who used the same outfitter as we did. We never climbed with any of these individuals, but we did eat and socialize with them while we were at base camp. The food at base camp was absolutely horrible. It generally consisted of spam, sardines, sometimes some boiled vegetables or some yak meat they would chop off of a hanging yak. Very difficult to stomach at that altitude. And to make things worse, the altitude actually causes you to lose your appetite. 
And so we would have to force down any of this food we would eat. And we would force down as much food as we could, but you can't eat enough to provide your body energy for the very long days. And each of us ended up losing between 20 and 30 pounds climbing Mount Everest. So forget about Weight Watchers and all the other diet programs. This is the best one. It's also not very sanitary at base camp or really anywhere on the mountain. And, and the altitude destroys your immune system or weakens it while you're there. And so it's extremely uh, difficult to get rid of these sicknesses. And the one example I have is when we were in, in, in Namche. I would say it's not uh, very, let's say, sanitary in a lot of places on the mountain. But we're staying in one of the small tea houses that the locals build um, lower down on the mountain. And the grandmother of the family who owned the tea house we were staying in, she had this awful gurgly cough. And we're sitting there in the small dining room eating the dinner they've prepared for us. She's just at the other side of the dining room drying our dishes. And we're watching her gurgly cough into the dish rag and then dry our dishes with the exact same spot. So we were not at all surprised when we got all these very bad, bad sicknesses. And because of this weakened immune system, we basically bounced from sickness to sickness for those two months. This is our home while we're at base camp. One of the real concerns is boredom. You spend so much time in your tent just allowing your body to build red blood cells. This was a shower tent at base camp. Doesn't look too enticing right now, but it was pretty nice at the time. We'd warm up some water, put it in this small jug, pump some pressure into it, and we're able to have a little bit of a bird bath every few weeks. One of the big safety concerns, especially at base camp and above, is the intense sun. There's not a lot of atmosphere to protect you from the sun and all of us got these very bad burns. A few areas you would not normally think of, the reflection of the intense sun off of the snow and ice actually burns the inside of your nostrils and the roof of your mouth. I wanted to touch on roles and responsibilities and how this applies, I would say, in an, in an agile or cohesive environment in, in particular. It makes sense in any team environment to align roles and responsibilities with individual strengths, and we tried to do that as well. My brother is an electrical engineer. He took the lead role when it came to the logistics around all of our electronics. Surprisingly complicated. How do we make this equipment survive for weeks at a time in some really inhospitable conditions higher up on the mountain? My sister's a nurse. She really took the lead role when it came to the medical challenges we're up against. Again, surprisingly complicated. Not only are our immune systems not functioning properly at altitude, but in Nepal you can get almost any medication over the counter without a doctor's prescription. And so there are a couple of problems. First off, it's often not genuine. It's just a fake or, or a knockoff. And uh, even if it is genuine though, because it's not accompanied by a prescription, it's often not taken properly. And so they don't finish the course and end up creating these super bugs that are resistant or immune to common Western medication. And that's what we're dealing with is a lot of these super bugs. My father had the most climbing experience. He took the lead role when it came to how far we can push into the altitude at a given point without taking on too much additional risk. And for myself, you could say I was the problem solver of the team. We got ourselves into a lot of different binds while we were there. It was quite a political disaster in Nepal while we were there, and I would have to come up with ways of getting us out of these different challenges that we found ourselves in. And here's really why we had to be more of an agile team than anything. In, in a lot of team environments or organizations, when some new challenge comes up, everyone throws their arms in the air and says, that's not my job. That's not in my job description. In an agile environment, as much as we have roles and responsibilities, I would say the, the boundaries between them are a little bit more blurred. The whole idea is to get everyone to understand the why, the end goal. What are we trying to collectively accomplish? And empower people to some degree with coming up with better ways of getting there. And so as much as we had these roles and responsibilities, we had to have a working knowledge of each other's roles and responsibilities because many times one or more of us wasn't physically there or wasn't cognitively there. In the high altitude, we're functioning on about a third mental capacity because of the lack of oxygen to our brains. And so the others would have to step in and pick up the slack in those instances. So you could say first and foremost, we have this individual accountability, but equally as important, we have this shared accountability where each of us has to realize that the success of each of us individually is very much tied to the success of this team as a whole. So from base camp is where the real climbing begins. And it begins with what we see in the background here called the Kumbu Icefall. The icefall is created as the Western Kumbu Glacier above us, which is continuously moving. It breaks off between these two mountain peaks. 
And as it does so, it creates these enormous chunks of ice called seracs, which move at four to six feet per day. Quite a dangerous section to go through. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of climbers killed from falling seracs or from ice avalanches in the Kumbu Icefall. You might remember a few years ago, there was an avalanche off of the shoulder of Everest that claimed the lives of 16 people near the top of the Kumbu Icefall. And to make things more difficult at this altitude, we have to change our climatization strategy a little bit. It's no longer enough just to go up slowly. So what we have to do from base camp, for example, is we go up to camp one, then we come back down to base camp for three or four days. Then we go up a little higher, come back down to base camp for three or four days. And this new acclimatization strategy caused us to have to go through the Kumbu Icefall six times. So at this point, we have adopted what is known as an iterative approach, which is really at the heart of an, an, an agile mentality. If you attend my agile session later in the day, we'll talk a lot more about uh, iterative approaches. But the whole idea with an iterative approach is to try to roll something of value out as quickly as possible so you can get the feedback and adjust your plan accordingly. Because we've all been involved in, in projects or endeavors and maybe it's a one or two year long endeavor and then we finally roll something out and then you get the feedback and you say, I wish we had this feedback a month ago, three months ago, six months ago, whatever it is, because we wouldn't have went that far down that path. And that's the real advantage of an iterative approach. You fail early on a smaller scale so that you can make adjustments and you don't fail catastrophically in the end. So we had this built into our expedition as well. We're, we're planning for about a, a one to two week push into the altitude to trigger the production of red blood cells. But if we stay there, we'll get edema and lose our lives. So at that point, we come back down, we do risk realization, we incorporate the lessons learned from that particular iteration that's what we use to make adjustments, and that's what we bring into the planning of our next iteration. And so we'd call that an iterative approach. The Kumbu Icefall is also one of the areas where risk management was so important. And we spent a huge amount of time in the, in the two years of planning for this expedition and identifying these risks, trying to understand the risks, and developing risk response strategies and or risk mitigation strategies. And we had a lot of these strategies for the risks that we, we were dealing with. The Kumbu Icefall is a good example. In, in the two years of planning, we determined that the majority of the movement of ice, that four to six feet per day, happens in the morning when the sun hits the ice and you get expansion of the ice. And so we adjusted our plan accordingly. We'd wake up at about one o'clock in the morning, try to get through the Kumbu Icefall all the way, or at least the majority of the way, before the sun even hit the ice. And we had similar risk mitigation strategies for a lot of the risks that we encountered on the mountain. This is just a quick look at our risk breakdown structure. If we break it into technical, internal, uh, external, and strategic risks, I won't go through them all, but you can see the many different uh, risks that we're dealing with in this case. And we're really doing qualitative risk assessment. And we don't have the capacity to deal with risks that should they be realized, the relative impact is going to be limited, minor, or, or even moderate. But for a lot of the risks that we're dealing with in this case, should they be realized, the relative impact is going to be catastrophic. It's going to lead to loss of life. And so for those risks where the relative impact is catastrophic, that's where we're focusing our, our risk mitigation strategies so that we can reduce the relative likelihood to where we have a manageable risk in the end. And that's how we really approach it. So the beginning of the icefall is fairly tame. But as we move up into the Kumbu icefall, you can begin to see these huge ice seracs which are really ready to fall at any moment. They're at the angle of repose. This is my brother Adam standing in front of one of the smaller seracs. Many of them are the size of apartment buildings. It really was quite a technical climb through the Kumbu Icefall as we navigated our way through these huge ice seracs. There were a lot of vertical ascents along the way. And in many places, we had to repel down these vertical ice walls into the icefall below. And there were fixed ropes throughout some of the ice fall, but these ropes can give you a bit of a false sense of security. Because a number of times we'd put our weight against these ropes and the anchors would just pull right out of the ice. The intense sun heats up the anchors and they just don't hold firmly in the ice. But by far the most nerve wracking part about the Kumbu ice fall is that there are about 50 of these very wide crevasses in the ice, which are hundreds and hundreds of feet deep, and we had to cross them on aluminum ladders tied together by thin climbing rope. 
This is what you see when you look down into one of the smaller crevasses. As you can see, they are virtually bottomless. And to make things worse, we're wearing crampons on the bottom of our mountaineering boots, which are a, a shredded spike for traction on snow and ice. But if you don't put your foot in the exact right spot on the ladder rungs, these shredded spikes actually lock onto the ladder rungs. And hovering above a seemingly bottomless crevasse, trying to yank your foot off of a ladder rung, is quite a unique experience. And some of these crevasses are very wide. This crevasse is about 35 to 40 feet across. In order to cross this crevasse, we have four aluminum ladders tied end to end. And when you cross with a heavy pack on your back, these ladders are creaking and swaying back and forth, and you really do take your life in your hands every time you cross. There are a few strings of ladders like this that were altogether terrifying. It's not uncommon because of the movement of ice in the Kumbu Icefall that pressure will build up and these crevasses can open or close quite suddenly. And I heard of at least one climber while we were there was crossing and the ladders just gave way beneath him, which is why you clip into these two loose safety ropes, which will save your life if this happens. Some of the ladders in the Kumbu Icefall were oriented vertically. There were two sections where we came across these vertical ice walls. In order to scale these ice walls, we had five aluminum ladders tied end to end. But if you look at these ladders on the right-hand side, you can see they're really not much better than the horizontal ladders. They are just haphazardly stacked end to end. And this was the section near the top of the Kumbu Icefall. Quite a technical section to go through. We had to actually climb up this vertical ice wall, cross on this narrow shoulder of ice before climbing another vertical ice wall and grabbing onto this ladder, which is hanging from above. So this is my sister, Laura, climbing in that particular section. And I have a short video showing you some of the interesting experiences we had in the Kumbu Icefall. You can see the root up there. Pretty technical. Doesn't it look like fun? <laughs> this is the worst ladder. It's a long way down. On an angle. And this end here, floating in the air. Or as it widens, the ropes keep pulling the anchors out because the crevasse is getting bigger. So as you can imagine, it is quite a relief every time you do get through the Kumbu Icefall. But we're not really out of the real danger zone yet because now we're in what's known as the Western Coombe or the Valley of Silence. And although it doesn't have the same movement of ice as the Kumbu Icefall, it is just covered with these very wide crevasses, which we had to cross very carefully. Some of the crevasses in the western Coombe were in fact so wide they couldn't be spanned by ladders. And we'd have to actually climb down into the crevasse and then out the other side. Or sometimes we're able to cross on these narrow ribs of ice which connected the glacier. After about 10 to 12 hours of very difficult climbing through the Kumbu Icefall, we finally arrive at Camp 1, about 19,000 vertical feet in elevation. Camp 1 is always very cold, very windy and fairly dangerous. A few years before we were there, there was a large chunk of ice that broke off from way up high in this mountain on the left, created an avalanche which swept right across this valley and wiped out all 60 tents. So you don't want to spend a lot of time at Camp 1. And the time you do spend there is spent in your tent, melting ice and snow to create drinking water. To aid in the acclimatization process, we had to drink between five and six liters of water a day, so about a gallon and a half of water, a huge amount of time spent in your tent, melting ice and snow. This is actually the route from Camp 1 to Camp 2. If you look closely, you can see those tiny dots are actually other climbers. 
They put the root there to avoid these huge crevasses in the, in the center of the Western Coombe, but we're at the base of this very high mountain called Nupse, and there's a lot of avalanches off of Nupse that you have to be very careful of. After about five to six hours of climbing, though, from Camp 1, we finally arrive at Camp 2, at 20,300 vertical feet. The tents at Camp 2 were erected right below these huge ice seracs, and I was a little bit concerned that one of these would break off and come towards the tents, although luckily this didn't happen while we were there. It can be a, a very lonely and desolate place to spend a lot of time, especially during a snowstorm. And there was a makeshift dining tent erected at Camp 2 while we were there, but it was even more rustic and the food than base camp, and the food was even worse. Almost every day we had what is known as Delbat, which is rice and lentils. Very, very difficult to stomach at that altitude. A lot of sickness at and around Camp 2. A lot of climbers having to return to base camp to try and recover. In terms of uh, the cost, it's very expensive to make an attempt on Mount Everest. It's not uncommon to have to spend over 100,000 US dollars per person. There's just a lot of logistics behind the scenes. And uh, we didn't have the money. We had to borrow money for this, and there were five of us to begin with. And so we tried to keep the cost down as best we could, and that we, we didn't have a guide. We carried all our own personal gear. We didn't have particularly good food. But there were things we didn't cheap on. We had the best mitts in the world, the best boots in the world. There were lots of climbers there with frozen ears, frozen eyeballs, missing fingers and toes. Everything horrible you can imagine happens on that mountain, and we didn't want any of that to happen. And so it really came down to this strategic allocation of resources. We'd look at every item and say, is this critical, and every activity as well, is this critical for our safety and success? If the answer is yes, we can't compromise. But we tried to cut out those, those nice-to-haves, you, you might say. In an agile terminolo terminology, we would call it maximizing the amount of work not done. You don't want to do, expend any energy that's not helping move you towards what you're trying to accomplish in the end. So it still was very expensive. It cost us about $45,000 per person. My sister Laura got a very bad gastrointestinal sickness around camp too. And it was so bad, it was actually causing her internal bleeding. So I have another short video showing you some of our experiences around Camp 2. How are we feeling, Dad? Oh, getting a little tired. <laughs> Been a long day. Here's Laura. Coming up. She's not doing so well today. Today is not one of her better days. She's uh, had some diarrhea. Threw up a few times, tends to set oneself back. But we're working our way to Camp 2. So from Camp 2, we continue up the Western Coombe for about an hour before we finally arrive at this very steep icy face. It's a 6,000 vertical foot ice face known as the Lotse face, and Camp 3 is located halfway up the Lotse face. The first time we were climbing on the Lotse face, my father and sister had an interesting experience. They're climbing along, they hear some climbers above them yell, rock, rock. They look up and this huge rock comes down just to their left-hand side. They looked at each other and so, well, that was close. They continue climbing a few minutes later, they hear, rock, rock, and this huge boulder comes down just to their right-hand side. And these rocks are moving very, very quickly because of the steepness of the Lotse face. And so you really do need to be careful about what is coming down at you from above when climbing on the Lotse face. This is just to try to show the steepness. We're looking at back at Camp 2 there in the distance. It's about 60 degrees to the horizontal most of the way up. But there were also a number of vertical sections, which at this altitude were very, very difficult to scale because of this lack of available oxygen. One of the times we were climbing on the Lotse face, a storm came in from the backside of the mountain, and it was just incredible how fast the weather could change. When the sun was out, it could seem relatively warm because of the reflection of the sun off of all the white surfaces. But within a matter of minutes, these storms would hit us from the backside of the mountain. It would go from relatively warm to extremely cold. We'd have to tighten the hoods of our jackets around so only our goggles were visible. Everest really creates its own weather. I wanted to touch on some of the mental strategies that I used on, on the mountain in particular. I've studied the human mind for a lot of my life, and I got so interested in our minds in that when I was in high school, in grade 10, I developed a very severe social phobia and anxiety disorder, which is known as generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD. And it's a little bit ironic that I do what I do now in terms of speaking at conferences all over the place, because anything that I thought could potentially result in, in public embarrassment, I would avoid that at all costs. 
But the problem with these avoidance strategies is that our minds flag those instances as threats, even though we haven't actually gone through them. And that begins to morph and expand and affect many different areas of our lives, as it did in my case. I could eventually hardly go out in public without having these continual panic attacks and heart palpitations and a lot of really negative physiological effects uh, from what I was going through. And that really just continued to get worse over the years and eventually morphed into depression. I went through a lot of years of just hating that part of me and living in my own mind more than anything, playing these mental movies of past disasters or just envisioning future disasters over and over and over again. And luckily after a lot of years of that, I finally decided enough's enough, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to, to figure this out. And that's really when I started studying the human mind and getting my hands on all the books that talked about what I was going through to try to get at those root causes and make those, those deeper cognitive changes that, that I think are so important. It became quite a passion of mine. I eventually went on to get my master's in psychology and I work with a lot of groups in that, that mental health space uh, in particular. I, I call that whole journey my, my internal Everest. In many ways, it was much more difficult than, than what I'm talking about today. But why I mention all of that is a lot of what I, I, I studied and learned and developed throughout that journey, I tried to apply on the mountain as well. For example, when it came to controlling my focus. There were many different times where I'd be moving so slowly that it would take me 10 minutes to get across the distance of a small room. And when you're moving that slowly, the prospect of reaching the summit just seems inobtainable. And you can soon talk yourself into just giving up and turning back, and many do. And so I would play these, these mental games with myself. At times I would forget about the summit and I would choose my own summit. It would be a chunk of rock or a piece of ice just about at the limit of what I could see. And that's all I'd allow myself to fill my mind with. And continue forcing myself to put one foot in front of the next until I reached that point. And then I'd allow myself to collapse on the ice for two to 10 minutes and I'd time it on my watch before forcing myself to my feet, choosing another summit and doing that over and over and over again. And I had a lot of these types of, of mental strategies that I, that I used on the mountain. After about 10 to 12 hours though, a very grueling climbing up that steep Lhotse face, we finally arrive at Camp 3, 23,600 vertical feet. The tents at Camp 3 were actually carved into the side of the Lhotse face. Because as you can see, there's not much of a plateau here at all. And there are ropes connecting all the tents together. The entire time you're at Camp 3, you need to make sure you're clipped into one of these ropes when traveling between the tents, because if you're not and you slip, you'll fall all the way down the Lhotse face, 3,000 vertical feet from here back towards Camp 2, and no one has ever survived a fall in the Lhotse face. So we made sure we were clipped in at all times. The first time we did climb to Camp 3, though, we had some incredible scenery. We're looking down at the clouds here. Beneath them would be Camp 2 and Base Camp further in the distance. That's actually Mount Pomori poking up through the clouds and behind it, Mount Choyoyu. Just another scenery shot from the interior of one of our tents. It was just really, really incredible that first time we climbed to Camp 3. So this is my sister Laura on the left, my father in the middle, and myself on the right. My brother Adam wasn't with us the first time we climbed to Camp 3. He'd gotten a very bad sickness and had to return to Base Camp to try and recover. If you look at this photo, you can see we all have great big smiles on our faces. It looks like we're having a great old time. But I assure you, it wasn't all fun and games. When I first arrived at Camp 3 and had rested in my tent, I had access to one of those finger medical sensors, the, 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 the pulse oximeters that test for your vital signs. And my resting heart rate was 120 beats per minute. My blood oxygen level was down to 67%. These low oxygen levels cause what's called Shane Stokes respiration, which is similar to a type of sleep apnea, in that all night during the night we'd wake up, sit straight up in our tents, just gasping for breath. It was a very scary situation to go through, and none of us really got any sleep that first night at Camp 3. So I have another short video showing you some of the good times we had at Camp 3. We're in a white out, so it's hard to see. Hopefully we'll get some. Here's Adam shortly after arriving at Camp 3. Doesn't he look like he's in the fine shape and having the time of his life? So much fun. So this is our sanctuary. Got water going on that end. Camp 3. Boy, it's water to drink. Down the tent. 
the uh, you pour part of the water out of one wall and another bottle so that you don't have any of the junk at the bottom that you're drinking. This is nice. Oh God, suck it back in the eyes. Oh, uh, okay. Suck it back in the eyes. This is camp three. So after that first time climbing to camp three, which was just for climatization, we went all the way back down to base camp. At about this point in the expedition, we're about a month and a half into the expedition, the majority of the other teams had just torn themselves apart from the inside out. Most of the time, the type of person that would want to attempt something like this to begin with is a type A personality person. You put a lot of type A's in small, horrible living conditions with sicknesses for extended periods of time and the conflicts and interpersonal challenges just destroyed the majority of, of the teams. Now we did have challenges within our team as well, but I think we were that much more prepared and, and willing and able to work through them because we'd already done other expeditions and, and adventures together before this. I did want to share this graph though, which is really just looking at a, the, the typical conflict timeline. And so this is a typical timeline. You have the issue arises, and then at some point later in time, a, a conflict arises over it. Um, then you get escalation up to a, a given emotional intensity where you, you reach a stalemate. Then the negotiation begins. You come back down with, with a resolution. You get more or less back to the same emotional intensity where you started. Now the challenge is for a lot of the, uh, for a lot of us, but this will be particularly a challenge for you if you are high in the personality trait of agreeableness. Is that in the interest of, of maintaining harmony, you will be prone to not saying what needs to be said when it needs to be said. And you're kind of sweeping things under the, under the rug um, in, in that sense. And in doing that, you're able to delay the onset of the conflict. But what ends up happening is these, the, the, the issues kind of bottle up within people. And within you, if you're, if you're high in the personality trait of agreeableness, you'll be prone to resentfulness in that things bottle up and eventually they explode. And you get this very steep escalation up to an emotional intensity that basically destroys the relationships. And then you come back down, but you don't actually uh, get back to the uh, original emotional intensity. You, you have this residual conflict that continues on uh, sometimes indefinitely. And um, this is, of course, very, I mean, I'm sure I don't have to tell you if you've been in kind of family <laughs> law or anything like that. This is very common in spousal relationships, years and years and years of not saying what needs to be said, you know, sweep it under the, 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 the rug so we don't have to deal with the conflict, and this is exactly what you'll get. And so really what we should be aiming for is, if we can borrow the COVID, COVID terminology, flattening the curve. As much as it's uncomfortable to have the conflict, say what needs to be said. It, you'll, a conflict will arise, but in so you're able to, to address it proactively and, and, and minimize that emotional intensity. This is actually a photo from the second time we've climbed to Camp 3. That first time just for climatization, but then we went all the way back down to base camp. Now we've come all the way back up, and we're actually starting our summit push from Camp 3. You can see in this photo we're wearing an oxygen mask. You do start oxygen that second time you climb to camp three, although it's a very small amount just to preserve your energy for higher up. From camp three, we continue up the load safe face for about an hour before we actually turn and traverse across the load safe face towards this yellowish band of rock, which is called the yellow band. This small incline that you see at the beginning of the yellow band probably took each of us 10 minutes to scale. It's just extremely difficult to move your body at that altitude because of this lack of available oxygen. Eventually though we did reach the top of the yellow band and we were faced with this seemingly easy snowfield to cross. But it just took forever. Hour after hour, one foot in front of the next, until we finally arrived at this anvil shaped chunk of rock you see on the left hand side called the Geneva Spur. And the Geneva Spur was difficult for a few reasons. First of all the intense wind had blown the majority of the snow off exposing the rock. And the crampons we're wearing on our mountaineering boots work very well on snow and ice, but not on rock. The metallic spikes just slip on the exposed rock. The second difficulty was that no one ever takes down the old ropes. No one has the energy to do so at that altitude. And so you don't know if the rope you're holding on to is this year's rope, or if it's been sitting there decaying in the sun for 10 years, in which case it'd be no good at all. 
And really, our only solution to this was to try to hold on to three or four ropes at the same time. And there was a near vertical section at the top of the Geneva Spur, which at this altitude was very, very difficult to scale. When we did reach the top of the Geneva Spur, though, we were greeted with some incredible scenery of the surrounding Himalayan mountains. And it was a fairly flat climb along the top of the Geneva Spur, which led us up to Camp 4. Camp 4 is the high camp. It's the last camp before the summit. It's also sometimes known as the South Col Camp, C-O-L, and it's in what is known as the Death Zone. The Death Zone is the area above 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters where there's not enough oxygen to support life. The entire time you're in the Death Zone, your body is just continuously degrading, and if you spend more than a few days there, you run the risk of not even having enough energy to go back down. What our cell, what's happening is our, our cells are dying all the time, but they're being regenerated. In the death zone, your cells are dying, but they're not being regenerated. Unfortunately, at this altitude, every, there are climbers that lose their lives every year. The year we were there was no exception. There were three people that died while we were there. And at one point, we even climbed past the body of a dead climber who had lost his life a few years earlier. This is one of our Sherpas, this is Zangbu, and Sherpas are, are local Nepalese climbers that were, were part of our team. We did have two Sherpas with us, and really they were our connection back to the outfitter that had supplied uh, some of the logistical support for the expedition. When we first started the expedition though, our Sherpas were very reserved. They spent most of the time in their tent, hardly spoke at all. We'd really only see them when we were climbing. And unfortunately, most climbers don't treat the Sherpas very well. It's unfortunate, but it's human nature to some degree. When people are sick and everything's going badly around them, they look around and say, who can I blame this on other than myself? And the Sherpas end up taking a lot of the brunt of that. And I think this is why they were so reserved to begin with. But we thought early on in the expedition, we have to find a way of integrating them into this, this team, or, or, or none of us are going to have a chance at our end goal. And so we spent a lot of time trying to break down those barriers between us and them. When we're eating, we'd invite them in to eat with us, reviewing our schedule, looking at risks, playing cards, telling jokes, whatever we were doing, uh, we included them in that. And it was really incredible how our relationship with them changed. They began to open up, began to talk and laugh with us. And more than anything, I would say we just became friends over that two-month expedition. And it was a huge advantage we had over the majority of the other teams. It wasn't us and them anymore. It was the six of us all working together to make this a reality for all of us. And so we really did build a, a great relationship with our Sherpas to the point where one of our Sherpas, Zangbu, actually invited us over to his house in Kathmandu after the expedition to celebrate his birthday with the rest of his family. So that was really quite special. At this point, we're standing at Camp 4 looking up at Mount Everest. And if we zoom in, you can actually see the route. It takes six hours to get from where we're standing up this very steep south face to this small plateau called the balcony. Another four hours to get from the balcony up this narrow ridge to what's known as the south summit that you see here. And then another two hours to get from the south summit to the actual summit of Mount Everest. So it takes 12 hours in total one way. But the worst part is that you actually climb it at night. And this is for two reasons. First of all, the weather is generally a little bit better at night but also you want to arrive in the light of day. And so we had spent eight hours climbing from Camp 3 to Camp 4. We arrive late in the evening. We have a few hours to melt some ice and snow, replenish our drinking water supplies, before heading out again that night with no rest and no sleep on our 12-hour summit attempt. Unfortunately, in the extreme cold, the flash in our camera wasn't working, and so we don't have a lot of photos during the night, but it was a very cold and miserable climb up that steep south face, and it was a blizzard for most of the night. Really, the worst part was that the blizzarding snow would cake to the outside of the climbing ropes. And we're using what's known as a Jumar ascender unit, which has a little cam in it with teeth, and it's designed to slide freely in one direction on the rope, and then lock when you put your weight against it. But the blizzarding snow built up on the ropes would fill in the little teeth of the cam, turn to ice, and just when we thought it was locked, it would release and we'd fall quite a ways down the mountain. That was a terrifying situation to go through. And one of the times I would say where resilience was so important. If I had to choose one word that separated those teams that were successful on the mountain from those that weren't, it would be resilience. There were just many different times where it would seem like 
There's not much else this mountain can possibly throw at us. In that instance, we're deathly ill. It's the middle of the night. We haven't slept in who knows how long. We have these tiny little headlamps illuminating a few feet in front of us. We're heading up to who knows where on this vertical uh, slope. Now it's a blizzard and to top it all off, our only safety device is failing us. What else is there? What, what, what else could this mountain possibly throw at us? But this is our current reality. How can we work within our current reality, pick ourselves back up and continue on forward? And if you can't get to that point, you, you talk yourself into turning back. So at this point, as the sun is beginning to rise, we're actually above the balcony and on our way towards the south summit. And as the sun does rise, it brings with it some incredible scenery of the surrounding Himalayan mountains. This is a photo we took of the shadow of Mount Everest on the surrounding mountains. It was just really, really incredible. It is just like looking out of an airplane from that altitude. There were some near vertical sections though before that south summit which were extremely difficult. At this point, we are on hands and knees clawing ourselves forward inch by inch. We did reach the south summit. We're standing on the south summit here looking up at Mount Everest. We each left one spare oxygen cylinder here at the south summit of the three oxygen cylinders we'd each brought before attempting this treacherous summit ridge, which you could call the Hillary Step section. The Hillary Step, named after Sir Edmund Hillary, is this last vertical rock climb on the summit ridge. So this is myself, my brother, and my father climbing on the summit ridge. The only other team up there that you see just ahead of us is actually that team supporting the 75-year-old gentleman from Japan who is <laughs> breaking the world record for the oldest person to reach the summit. Very technical section, a lot of exposed rocks. Our crampons are slipping on the exposed rocks. But I still remember the feeling. When I got to the top of the Hillary Step, I'm looking up the small frozen incline towards the summit of Mount Everest, and that's when I realized we're going to make it to the top of the world. Here we are, the top of Mount Everest. There's Dad. Say hello, Dad. Too late. It's not good. This way, Alan. What? Alan. So it was pretty incredible to be there. This is my father on the left, myself in the middle, my brother Adam on the right. I'll talk about my sister Laura in just a few moments. But everywhere we look around us, 360 degrees, everything is below us. We took our oxygen masks off temporarily in order to take some photos at the summit, and it was just really, really incredible after almost two months of climbing to have finally reached our end goal. We did have a, a satellite phone with us, and we were able to make a couple of very short calls from the summit. My father, of course, called my mother, and I called my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, but um, I also called the, the engineering company that I worked for at the time uh, here in North America, and it was the middle of the night here in North America, so the phone call was recorded, and I'll play that for you now. Hi, Tom. It's Alan Mallory of Mount Everest. My, uh, myself, my, uh, my father, my brother, have reached the highest point on Earth, and we're looking down on the world, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, we're about just about to head down. There's very little oxygen up here, and I'm looking forward to a warm shower and a cold beer. But it's been an amazing experience. Hope all is well at Hatch. Uh, take care, and I'll talk to you in a few weeks. So we spent about 20 minutes at the summit, really longer than we should have before starting to head down. And the way down is considered by most climbers to be even more dangerous than the way up. And it's really for two reasons. First of all, your body is completely exhausted, but also your mind is exhausted. We had been climbing for that, at that point for well over 30 hours with no rest and no sleep, and our bodies and minds were beginning to shut down. Unfortunately, in this condition, it's very easy to make a mistake, and a lot of climbers have lost their lives on the way down for that reason. We had our two biggest scares on the way down, and my biggest scare happened just after going down the Hillary Step when I actually ran out of oxygen. 
I realized this is what had happened. I collapsed on the ice, ripped off my mask, just gasping for breath. And almost immediately, because I'd been exerting myself, my inner core went very cold. It's this weird type of cold. And my limbs started shaking uncontrollably. I knew this was a very bad place to have this happen because there's about a 2,000 vertical foot drop on both sides of that narrow summit ridge. I forced myself to my feet, tried to go a little bit further, but didn't make it very far at all before I, I collapsed again on the ice. And I turned to one of our Sherpa, Sangye, and I said, I can't go on, I, I need oxygen. And luckily I'm very thankful he decided to give me his oxygen cylinder. Because he lives in the area, he would be a little better off than I would be without the oxygen, although it's still very difficult for him. So I lay there on the ice, he went into my pack, switched our oxygen cylinders, and I, I asked him, turn my regulator right up to three liters per minute, which is very high, the maximum is actually four, but I wanted these symptoms to go away. So he set the regulator, he said, okay, you're good, continue on down. I put my mask back on, started to continue down, but these symptoms just continued to get worse until the point that my, my limbs were shaking so violently that I couldn't even hold onto the rope. And that's when I really started to panic. I thought, I'm on oxygen, this is getting worse, I'm gonna die up here. And it wasn't that crazy a thought to have because there's been almost 200 climbers lose their lives in that very same area, and most of them would have entered into the same situation that I'd entered into. I didn't make it very far at all before I came to where my father was, and he'd now run out of oxygen as well and was leaning up against this wall of ice. And I stumbled up to him, I said, Dad, I, I think I have haste, which is this cerebral edema I was telling you about earlier. And he had a steroid pill, which you can take to help out a little bit with this type of edema. But I said, before I take that steroid pill, go into my pack and turn my regulator right up to the maximum of four liters per minute. And I again collapsed on the ice, and I remember just how scared I was, because a rescue attempt from that altitude would just be a shot in the dark. I would be dead by the time they got me down to a safe altitude. Luckily, though, when my father went into my pack, he discovered that there was actually a problem with my regulator, which was preventing the oxygen from coming out at all. He was able to eventually notice and eventually rectify this problem, get the oxygen back on, and these symptoms began to subside a little bit. But it was a terrifying situation to go through, as you can imagine. And my father had to go without oxygen as well for quite a while before we were able to get his one spare oxygen cylinder to him from the south summit where we'd each left that one spare oxygen cylinder. Still very technical and difficult going down that, that steep south face. We're looking back at Camp 4 here in the distance. This is actually the point where we pass by the body of the dead climber. And the danger is when you get back to Camp 4, you're so completely exhausted that you go into your tent and fall asleep immediately. It would be very easy to do, but unfortunately some climbers that do this never wake up. You need to make sure you're on oxygen, you're on the proper amount of oxygen, your oxygen cylinder is not going to run out sometime during the night, and that you don't fall asleep with your arm outside of your sleeping bag because the blood circulation is so poor at this altitude that climbers have woken up to a dead frozen arm and had to climb down in whatever position it was frozen in. So this is me holding my lifeline. One thing I never mentioned much about was my sister, Laura. Laura had been with us that previous evening when we set out from Camp 4 towards the summit. She still had that very bad gastrointestinal sickness, which is causing her the internal bleeding. She had blood coming out both ends. And she didn't make it very far at all before she fell, and she called us on the radio and said, I can't go on, I'm going back to Camp 4, and the three of us continued on. Well, she spent that next day at Camp 4 on oxygen, and I guess she realized she's never going to have another opportunity. She's one day away from the summit of Mount Everest. And so when we got back down to Camp 4, she went up to my father and said, what do you think? Do you think I should give it another try? And at first he thought she must have gone crazy. Because after seeing the condition that we were in, we couldn't even get our own boots off. We were in a state of delirium more than anything. To want to make another attempt by herself in her condition, it just seemed crazy. But he said, I want to leave it up to you. If you think you should, then you should. There are a few problems. Our Sherpas couldn't make another attempt. They were like us. We had to get down out of the death zone as fast as we could. Our lives were in danger spending any more time there. But there was another Sherpa there with a lady from Singapore. And this lady wasn't able to make it much past Camp 4 before she turned back and gave up. And so she decided to let her Sherpa make an attempt with Laura. 
So that was the first problem solved. Laura had also used too much of her, her oxygen, and she didn't have the three cylinders needed in order to make an attempt, and it didn't look like she was going to be able to, other than there was another gentleman who used the same outfit as we did, who had turned back just before getting to Camp 4, and so oxygen had been left there for him. And so with some negotiation over the, the radio, she was able to make use of those cylinders in order to make an attempt. And so that night, at about 8 o'clock p.m., Laura headed out towards the summit, all by herself, except for that one Sherpa. The next day, though, we really had our, our biggest scare of the expedition, because we should have heard from Laura at about 8 o'clock the next morning. She leaves 8 o'clock the night before. It takes about 12 hours. But we didn't hear from her. Soon it was 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. We're trying to reach them on the radios. Base camp can hear us trying to communicate. They're trying to reach them almost continuously. There's no response. Soon it's 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. At that point, we're getting very, very worried. Because even if she'd had a minor fall, like a sprained ankle or something like that, she'd be running out of oxygen. And at that point, there's very little anyone can do for her. Even if we could have made another attempt, which in our physical condition wouldn't have been possible, but it would have taken us over 10 hours to get up to where she was. And so it was very, very scary, as you can imagine. And we didn't hear from Laura until well into the afternoon when we finally got a call on the radio. What did end up happening is she made it all the way to the summit by herself, uh, except for the one Sherpa. She made us the first and only family of four in the world to reach the summit of Mount Everest. But she left her radio at Camp 4, and her Sherpa's radio had run out of batteries. And so they weren't able to contact anyone until they got back down to Camp 4. As you can imagine, it was a huge relief to hear from her. And my father said she'd get a big hug when she got back down to base camp, and that's exactly what she got. One of the last things I want to talk about is, is the importance of empowering team members. And I would say the, the dialogue between my father and sister, it's a bit of a a controversial dialogue. I mean, how could my father allow her to make her own decision in an extreme environment like that? And I have three young kids of my own now, and I think this would be very difficult and perhaps foolish in, in many ways. But I can also see the other side of the coin. Had my father prevented her from making her own decision, she could easily have lifelong animosity about that. And that's similar to exactly what happens in any team environment if we're continuously disempowering others, trumping others' ideas, dictating this is how it has to be done. Good people, good team members, they'll just leave the team or leave the organization because they're not being challenged and they're not being developed. Most of the time, why we're disempowering others is we don't want a mistake someone else makes to look bad on us. And so we end up taking on way too much ourselves and kind of micromanaging things. And I would say it's about doing it strategically. You start small, so that when a, a mistake is made, it's a, it's a learning experience rather than a disaster that's going to cripple the organization, and you build people up from there. My father's always had that mentality, and I think that's why he stuck with it even in an extreme environment like this. I did want to share this graph, though, which is my view on the relationship between productivity and creativity, and you could call it the overall success, and, and the amount of structure we have in place. In any team environment or relationship or organization where you have very few processes and procedures in place, you just end up with chaos because every new idea, someone runs with it in a different direction. And you have very little alignment in that sense when you're too far on the left-hand side of this graph. And consequently, the productivity and creativity is very low. But we have a parabolic relationship here in that it's equally as detrimental, if not worse, when you're too far on the right-hand side of this graph. This is the mentality of, we've always done it this way, we're just gonna continue doing it this way. The problem is that society changes. People's needs change, our environment changes. And when you're too far on the right-hand side of this graph, everyone's hands are tied, and you're just not able to adapt. A lot of organizations and companies have went bankrupt from being too far on, on the right-hand side of this graph when, when society's needs change. And this is a, now, there's a, there's a place for uh, procedures. If you want consistency, you use a procedure. But you have to realize you're telling that, the, the, that individual or that group, you have to do it this way. And so people stop using their, their, their own minds in, in order to come up with better ways. And so even within procedures, you can think of, well, how can I you know, allow people to use their own, their, their own capacity to, to come up with better ways? Otherwise, we kind of remain stagnant. It's a continuous process. Sometimes you, you float too far to the left. 
Sometimes you float too far to the right. But the whole idea is to notice when this is the case. And so that you can be part of the solution of bringing everyone back to center, where you have enough structure in place that you've achieved the alignment. Everyone is moving more or less in the same direction. But you haven't stifled the innovation and creativity that's needed in order to be able to continue, continually adapt and improve. And that's really where you, you reach the sweet spot, where you maximize your productivity and creativity and overall chances of success. It really was a huge relief when we were all safely back at base camp. We'd come down from the summit, down past Camp 4, down the Geneva Spur, down the Yellow Band, down the Lhotse Face, through the Valley of Silence, and down through the Kumbu Icefall. And at this point, we're out of the real danger zone. And all we wanted to do was to get off that mountain. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did, is we headed out just as quickly as we could. The, the trek out from base camp, though, was actually quite interesting. Because we had just spent two months in Nepal, and Nepal was going into summertime. And so the Kumbu Valley below base camp had come alive with these flowering trees along the way. There was also a lot of really interesting wildlife that showed up along the way. But the best part was that we had just spent two months building up red blood cells. And we had a ton of red blood cells in our bodies, over double what I have right now. We had done what you could call natural blood doping. You've heard of blood doping in the Olympics. It's illegal, but athletes will take blood out of their bodies, allow their bodies to build red blood cells, and then put the blood back in in order to artificially increase their red blood cell count for a competitive advantage. We had done this completely naturally to the extreme. We had a huge number of red blood cells in our bodies. And as we're heading down into an oxygen-rich environment, we just felt like superhumans. We could charge along that trail at full speed, day or night, and our hearts were barely even beating. It was just like a resting heart rate. An incredible feeling and situation to go through. When we did get back down to Lukla, though, we took the first flight we could out of Lukla, back to Kathmandu. We signed into the hotel, went to the biggest buffet we could find. <laughs> and after two months of a very difficult expedition, we were finally able to relax. So Edmund Hillary once said, it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. And looking back at our journey on Mount Everest, I think this is a very true quote. It's as much of a mental journey as a uh, challenge as anything else. And uh, this is the real reason why historically, when we were there, of all the climbers that attempt Everest every year, it's only about 29% that are successful. Over 70% of climbers talk themselves into turning back long before they get anywhere near the end of that, that two month expedition. We had some huge advantages being a family on the mountain. The first was we'd already built the trust, but also we knew how to overcome a lot of these conflicts and interpersonal challenges that just destroyed the majority of the other teams. And perhaps most importantly, we really looked out for each other that much more than a random climber that would join an expedition in order to make an attempt on Mount Everest. As with most things in life, it's, it's a lot easier to turn back than to face the challenges ahead. And the biggest challenge of Everest, I would say, was the integration of everything I just talked about. Just the biological challenges on their own, which I didn't go into graphic detail about, but they were horrible. And you combine that with the altitude challenges and the climatization challenges and the physical and mental and emotional and interpersonal challenges. That's where it becomes almost impossible. The message I wanna leave you with is not to go climb Everest. I don't recommend this to any of my friends, <laughs> but we all have our own Everest in life or in our family, or in our organization, or whatever it is. And this is the same passion, and commitment, and planning, and resilience, and agility, and everything that's involved in working through those challenges to make whatever you're aiming for a reality. And so the only question is, what is your Everest? Thank you very much. I tried to leave a, a few minutes for questions. I don't know if there are any questions. Anyone want to sign up for next year's expedition? <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. What does the Sherpas have that give them stamina? Well, you know, in many ways, there's kind of a misperception uh, that the Sherpas can kind of just march up and down to the summit day and night. And it's not really true. I mean, most of the Sherpas have never been to the summit. 
And you can kind of look at it statistically. It's a, you know, they'd only have a chance, but one every three years, because it's only 29% of their clients, their climbers. And then of all the Sherpas involved, only one or two would be the high altitude Sherpas to make that, that, that final push. And so many have, have uh, you know, haven't been to the summit. But I would say what, why the Sherpas are the, I mean, they have the caste system over there. So they're kind of the class of people that have been historically helping climbers for, well, since the beginning of climbing in the, in the Himalayas. And they're very, you know, in, generalizing a little bit, but they're very kind of humble and, and, and uh, down to earth individuals. And I think that's why they, they, it makes them so uh, reliable. They don't get caught up in the emotional nonsense that most of the, the, the climbers do. And so um, now they would also start earlier, like to set up the, the base camp and so on. And so they do have a little bit more acclimatization, but they still used oxygen and, and went through, you know, much of what we had to, to go through in the, in the two month uh, climbing period. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, well, at first, I mean, the question was about kind of the, the history. And I mean, when even before Hillary, there were many do, making attempts. And so and on other mountains, you kind of learn the acclimatization process, but it was still very much trial and error back in 1953, for example, when, um, when Hillary climbed or even further back in the 20s when, when George Mallory was climbing. And so I mean, sometimes I ask the trivia question. We, we had two uh, Sherpas with us. How many Sherpas do you think uh, Hillary had in 1953? Any guesses? None? One? Any other guesses? The answer is 400. And so it kind of puts it into perspective. I, it, it, I mean, it still doesn't take, like, it was incredible what they did, but it was also very well funded and supported expedition. They were two months getting to where we started because Hillary established the airport in Lukla. They had to start in Kathmandu. And so, and of course, they like they have leather wrappings. They don't have the Kevlar boots and everything that we have nowadays. And so, um, it's pretty incredible what they they went through. But there's hundreds of people carrying ropes and ladders and everything that's involved in in making those pushes um, through the icefall, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> trying to get, try to scratch it off and change change direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are yeah, and then there's some large ones. I mean, in general, you should take about uh, eight to ten days. Otherwise, you you uh, you risk getting mountain sickness. But. It is, it, I recommend that to a lot of people. It's a different world. When you see how they terrace the sides of the mountains to grow vegetables, and it really is something special. But you don't get the ice until you get the Yeah. Yeah. So there's no need No, they won't allow you to go up into the ice fall without the permits, yeah. Well, it's all relative. A lot of people find it pretty tough, but you're not gonna encounter much ice and snow, probably not any ice and snow. It's just technical in terms of steep and rocky. But there's no, like, you're not no. Be no. <laughs> You'll find out when you get there, and they, when, they, when they hand you the harness. No, you won't have to do <laughs> No. Uh, no, no, I know I have, yeah. Yeah, but you'll enjoy it. It's a, I mean, the flight in is a little bit uh, risky, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything from online or, okay, back here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Well, we do have a, you know, I would say a unique family dynamic. And then it might, I would, you know, thank my father, I guess, for getting us into the types of things that are young in life that he enjoys. And so it's not, you know, a lot of families on Thanksgiving or Christmas, it's really quite a, if the, all the interests are different, it's like you're kind of counting down the hours until it's over. Usually we're doing like, we're out 
snowshoeing or cross country skiing or something we all enjoy anyway. And I would say more than anything, it was our lifestyle that prepared us to take on something like this. You have to, that's how you kind of build the resilience and, and it, it's, it's extreme problem solving. And how you, you problem solve is you kind of, and a lot of this happens subconsciously, but you're thinking back to the other ways that you worked through those other adventure challenges that you found yourselves in. And that's how you come up with ways of getting yourself out of the, the current ones. And so that's where our lifestyle was really so, so beneficial. Yeah. So, and now we, we still, I mean, we got along pretty well before the expedition and we, and we still do. I don't know if the, really the dynamics change too much. So, other questions? There's some blue forms on the table. If you're interested, it's kind of a feedback, but I, I send out a monthly video at the end of each month. It's usually some aspect of personal development combined with some aspect of adventure. So it's free. You just have to, if you want to grab one of those blue forms, I certainly appreciate the feedback as well, but you can, uh, you can just, check off the bottom if you're interested. And if there's not enough, just put, put, put uh, two of you can use the, the one form. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could say, I mean, you got to look at statistically, the odds of one of us making it were very low. And so while well, you know, four of, uh, of us made it, uh, so we did something different. Now you could, now I don't know if I would come to the conclusion, oh, you should just always forego a guide and just do it yourself. We had, we thought we had, we'd done a lot of expeditions before this. And so we had, we thought we had the know-how. And more importantly, we wanted to be in control of when we climbed and when we didn't. And, and it can be dangerous if the guide is saying, look, we got this sick climber, we all need to wait at base camp, but you're feeling healthy, that's when you need to push. But equally as important when, if the guide is saying, it's sunny out, let's go, and your body's saying, no, you don't, you don't need to push, that's when you, you, we need to be resting. And so we wanted to be in control of when that happened and when it didn't. At least if we made a mistake, it's on us. And so um, it's not like we ignored what we learned from our, our outfitter and all of that. We tried to bring it all in, but in the end, we, sometimes we, we didn't do what they suggested. And we kind of, you know, combined our own experience and knowledge from the other expeditions with what we learned from our, our outfitter and our, our Sherpas, for example. So, last questions, yep. <laughs> Any plans just to have fun, that would be the word. Um, I, it's not fun. <laughs> it, it's difficult to enjoy any of what I just talked about, especially because of the, the, the biological challenges, but it's, it's kind of, and it's, in some ways it's surreal because of this, this lack of oxygen to your brain. And so I don't really plan on doing it again. Um, the, the only exception might be if, if my, I have three young kids and it's kind of a family tradition. Their grandfather has their aunt, their uncle, their father. Now I'm not going to be encouraging that, but if we go back to the graph I shared, you kind of have to find that balance even within, within your own family. You don't want to, you know, there's lots of examples if, you, if you're too kind of controlling or if, you, or if you don't provide any kind of mentorship. And so as parents, we're always kind of trying to find that balance. And so I wouldn't want to overly, let's say, discourage them if they have their own path that they want to pursue in life. So, any last questions? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question was about climate change. Is it more difficult? I would say it's probably the opposite, although it's, it's creating some new challenges and some natural disasters that have claimed lives. But when Hillary climbed, um, their base, ca base camp was, uh, I never, didn't show a photo of it, but the last village is called Gorak Shep, and it has a hotel now. It's the highest inn in the entire world. But that's where the, the Kumbu Icefall used to go all the way to Gorak Shep. And so it is, re the glaciers have receded about 50%. And so I would say in general, that has probably made it easier. Um, but there's new challenges nowadays, of course, you know, with the ice moving and all of that as things warm up and now they're allowing more climbers to, they're issuing more permits. And so that has uh, been attributed to a lot of the deaths we've seen in, in recent years where they kind of re have relaxed the, it, because they need the money, in Nepal's a very poor country, they kind of relax the, climbing resume that you should have if you're going to attempt something like this. And so there's climbers there that maybe aren't prepared and shouldn't be. So there's lots of, um, you know, questions about, well, is that the right direction to go? So, last questions, yeah? Okay, now that you, in your family's time, have conquered Yeah. how do you translate that into your achievable goals? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a great question. I would say that's some of an area that's near and dear to my heart in terms of this, the psychology and so on. And um, it's actually, like I've been through many different Everests in my life. I talked a little bit about my internal Everest and, and I've been through many things like that. And the whole idea is to, to work through them and bring what you learn from each one into the next challenge or, or, or Everest in your life. And that actually is surprisingly, um, from a psychological perspective, is surprisingly important. And you touched on a, a good point. There are, have been climbers that have reached the summit of Everest that have went into depression afterwards or, or accomplished other monumental things in life. And some of you probably have even experienced this. And it's because we, we tend to think that what, um, one of the ways that we, we get meaning in life is, is through our accomplishments. And it, it's partially true, but not really. It, it, it's the pursuit of something that is of value to you, that is bringing meaning to your life. And that's why people can go into depression after they do something like this. If you don't have something else, what else is there? And so um, you need to make sure you're always pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to some degree. And I've experienced this in my own life when finally things kind of work out, but then there's this, this stagnation that sets in, this complacency. And uh, I kind of don't feel that same meaning. And so that's why, and I choose another Everest and, and you know, continue. Um, it doesn't, well, you want it to be an obsession per se. You got to find a balance, but it's important to always be aiming for something, always be pushing for something. And, um, and I've learned just how important that is uh, in my own life. Um, if anyone's approaching the age of retirement, I would say that's equally as important. The number of people that actually perish within a few years of retirement is much higher than it should be. And I think it's people that think kind of counting down the days to retirement and then I'm just going to sit on my couch and, and uh, drink margaritas. We're not designed and built for drinking margaritas on couches. We're, you know, we need to have some sort of adversity we're working through on the, on the, on the path to accomplishing something of value. And whether that's in philanthropy or, or business or, or mountaineering or whatever it is, make sure you're, you're, you're aiming for an Everest, I guess is how I'd leave it. So if anyone's interested, I do have a, a few copies of my books here and you can find them on uh, Amazon and all over the place. But if you want a signed copy, um, my new one actually just come out. If you're interested in the psychological uh, aspects, it's called Summits of Self and it's really about that journey and kind of the incremental improvements you can make in life. So, um, so I'll leave it at that and they're 20 and I'll certainly sign it for you. And if I die, it might be worth big bucks. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, everyone.